Gangs don't hear. So, um, sorry if anyone was really like tuning in with bated breath to our committee hearing. This is a little bit of a false alarm stop here. We are going to hear about H55, which was referred to us from the Commerce Committee. And um, we're going to sort of get all of our information about it today and then just try for, a, if possible, a quick vote tomorrow on it so we can warn the vote. Um, and so with that, um, much gratitude to the whole committee for gathering together quickly, as well as Representative Mulvaney Stanek for running upstairs quickly and Damien for running up more, up more stairs even quicker. So, <laughs> Emma, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, for your record, I'm Representative Emma Mulvaney Stanek. I'm the bill reporter on H55 from House Commerce and Economic Development. Thank you very much for squeezing this in. Uh, so H55 is actually um, two bills in one related to unemployment. Uh, I believe your committee would probably be most interested in two provisions in it. However, I'm happy to give you an overview of the entire bill. Um, so I believe the, the areas of interest for ways and means would be related to um, the first, actually technically this, I want to go my other notes here. Um, technically, it's the section um, that now, section three, that now will include nonprofits, all nonprofits within um, the unemployment system. So right now in Vermont, federal government allows states uh, to opt in to whether to include all nonprofits or not in Vermont for um, until this bill has decided to not require uh, nonprofits to have fewer than four employees from having to pay into the unemployment system. So we learned a lot during the uh, pandemic and included that many people who because of the, um, the orders uh, from government to shut down in, in employment. Uh, many people who work for small nonprofits unfortunately realized they were not eligible for the pandemic related unemployment that was offered because they indeed are not eligible for state unemployment because this has been Vermont law. Again, some very small nonprofits. So we heard testimony last biennium and again, this biennium and this bill came forward about um, trying to be fair, frankly, and make sure all employers were required to pay into the unemployment system so their workers could access the system um, as uh, if they were laid off uh, through no fault of their own. So that, that provision of H55, I believe, would be of interest to Ways and Means. Uh, the nonprofit employers would be able to have two options uh, eligible for paying into the system. One would be considered a um, contributing employer. Let me make sure I was just talking to Damien to make sure I got these terms right. A, a taxable employer, excuse me, taxable employer, right? Um, and that is what uh, most employers opt into. Uh, nonprofits have the option to be reimbursable, large employer and nonprofits right now, reimbursable or taxable. And so this would be an option uh, given to small nonprofits as well. So a taxable employer uh, allows you to sort of pay um, quarterly based on your payroll tax, underlying payroll tax um, throughout the year. It's something that you can budget for. It's something that for a nonprofit you could budget for. And it's a predictable way to pay into the system based on how large your payroll is. So if your payroll expands because you hire more folks or you start paying people more folks, your obligation grows. If it shrinks, it shrinks, et cetera. The other option is to be a reimbursable employer, which the state of Vermont and municipal um, employers are required to be. And that is basically to simplify it, a pay as you go kind of model, where if you have an employee who gets laid off, um, it goes on unemployment, for example, then you have to pay um, what that, that employee's unemployment benefits would be, which can be a sizable amount of money if you haven't been pl planning for it. So we had that discussion in commerce. Um, and that is why you'll see in this bill, there's actually for nonprofits, there's a delay in the effective date for when this would apply for nonprofits to allow them to both get up to speed, be educated on what this change would mean to start planning around their fiscal year budgets, et cetera, before the implementation, which would be July 1st of 2024 for when nonprofits would start to be eligible and small nonprofits would be eligible for the unemployment system. Um, you'll see later in this bill, there's a whole effort by, led by the Department of Labor, uh, working in partnership with the Secretary of State to do a whole robust outreach effort to nonprofits. We've included municipal government in that as well because uh, the Vermont League of City and Towns came in and said they should, they would also benefit from some education on how to really um, prepare and pay into the system, all the complexities of unemployment. So we were really trying to be conscious around wrapping around these new eligible employers to make sure this wasn't a sudden change this July 1st. So that's probably the first section you're interested in. The second version, um, the second part, I'm going to go back to my notes from Damian because I, he and I were just going back and forth on this to make sure I get this right to explain this, this process. So um, 
a, a year or so ago, last biennium, we, we made some changes into how contributions were happening to the unemployment system, because when there was a historic use of unemployment in 2020 during the pandemic, obviously we drained down the unemployment system because lots of people, a historically high number of people were using the unemployment system. And so per usual of our employer formula that triggered, it would trigger normally that employers would, their tax contribution rate would spike in order to refill that fund as quickly as possible. And so at that time, we did a whole larger discussion as a legislature around modifying that contribution so that the spike in, in the employer contribution was not so sharp because we did not need to fill the fund so quickly. So we modified that. And as part of that larger conversation, we also talked about increasing um, the benefit for unemployment claimants as sort of a compromise or a, a, a balancing of that so that workers also benefited from our, um, our efforts in that, in that piece of policy. So when we were doing all those different components, um, there are a few things that happened along the way. And largely what we were trying to do was um, make sure that we were moving uh, an amount of funds to UI claimants over a course of years, accommodating the fact that we have a very old and rusty mainframe system with the unemployment system and that we were prohibited from doing some of our initial policy ideas of incre increasing the claimant amount based on, because every claimant gets a different amount based on what their job wages were, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into those details, but just know what we were prohibited from doing that through the mainframe and also a decision by the US Department of Labor at the time. So we made another attempt to do another version to get, again, uh, money to claimants. And when we were doing all those uh, different formulas and, and technical pieces, um, the, the formula got a little funky, um, that maybe that's not the right term, but the formula, the language we realized last summer needed to be um, tightened up because it created a gap or unintended consequence that we wanted to make sure was clarified. And that's why it's in this bill now. And so right now, and I'm gonna go through this um, line by line so I don't get this wrong, but the issue um, is that when we were able to add a $60 increase to the maximum weekly benefit, because again, the rusty mainframe only allowed us to touch the maximum weekly benefit, but that was our temporary fix. And so we went ahead and added a $60 increase to the maximum weekly benefit starting last July 1st. And that benefit is set to expire once we hit $8 million of, of payout basically within that formula. Um, and, and then the, the statute uh, right now, the underlying statute does not permit the maximum weekly wage benefit to ever decrease. So when we started doing this formula and playing out the $60 uh, maximum weekly benefit over a course of time and with that maximum weekly benefit under state law not being allowed to decrease, um, when that $60 amount expires, the maximum weekly benefit will remain at that same level with until the formula for setting the maximum weekly benefit allows it to increase. So there's gonna be this gap timing issue. And so the language that we're proposing in H55 will um, rectify that, will clarify that our original intent, which is essentially that we want to make sure that, um, let me get this right. I might have to phone a friend here. Depending, uh, you know, I'm gonna phone a friend on this because I almost have this down, but I feel like I'm gonna, I'm gonna like trip on the last bit here. Mm -hmm. The concept is that we wanna make sure that our intent with the way that we wrote the original language um, is clarified so that we are not, um, that we're spending out the amount of money that we had in the temporary fix for the $8 million and then the overall $100 million for the additional benefits, which is the original intent of our bill, plays out effectively over time. Okay. So Amy's gonna clarify that. Yeah, we're happy to just have you explain your committee's yeah. intent and then we'll get Great. The technical details Great. of it from Damien. There's no need for you to try to so do any of that. They put out the questions on the floor and so I will have this down by the time Okay, no, and we like, no, really, it's, <laughs> yeah. Damien is gonna take us through all of it. We just wanna know validating the bother. Yes. Thank you. He took, yes. a, he took a little bit longer this summer to go over the, the language stuff. So, um, so our vote was 902 on the H55 overall. So this has the full support of the committee minus two folks who are not in attendance. Thank you okay. very much. Really appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Just just use the the slow monotone voice on the floor. <laughs> Turn the heat up before you start. <laughs> Make sure your reports right after lunch. Everybody's feeling a little tired. Um, <laughs> thank you. Would it be helpful if I shared the language on the screen? That would be great if you can, but Sorsha, it, Sorsha um, does exist and she and does by the computer and so she can help you and knows what you're saying right now. I'll, I'll send you the link. Great. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you, Sorsha. <laughs> so, 
So the I'll start with the first piece, the um, the nonprofit employers who are being brought in. While it does technically affect the revenues of the state, it's kind of a <coughs> basically a net zero. Um, it's it's not going to either drive the balance of the trust fund up very much, and it will not deplete the trust fund because the the nonprofits who decide to become contributing or taxable employers will be paying a very small amount in the grand scheme of our hundreds of millions of dollars in the UI trust fund. Um, and then the ones who decide to become reimbursing employers, meaning they'll pay if and when there's unemployment expenses attributable to their account, uh, those employers, it's, it's a wash for the fund. Basically, the money goes out, a bill goes to the nonprofit, the nonprofit pays the bill. So from that standpoint, that's a pretty straightforward one. We're just deleting the language that says has four or more employees. Uh, so it's going to now apply to all nonprofits. Yeah, Representative that's a tiny question, but what happens if you send out the money before they send you the money that they owe you? So so that, that's the way it has worked with the unemployment insurance system for the last 45 years. Okay. So um, for it, it's essentially the, the issue comes up, it's a quarterly true up. So at the end of every quarter, the, uh, the system bills reimbursing employers. There, yeah, you do see a dip and then it bounces back. Um, the only times that this has been an issue are like the 2008 recession where we ran into the red with the trust fund and had to borrow from the feds and then pay that money back. We since then have restructured the, the reason that happened is because the, the taxable wages, the taxable wage base. So it had stayed frozen since uh, 1987, I believe. And meanwhile, we've been increasing the maximum weekly benefits every year. So you can imagine uh, we had a very healthy trust fund through the 90s. And then in the 2000s, it started to lose money. And then the 2008 recession hit and it went into the red in a hurry because there was no money in there. So since, as part of what was then called the grand bargain, they traded uh, things like adding in a waiting period uh, temporarily and then increasing the contribution amount um, or the amount of wages that are taxable uh, every year because we, we can't change the tax rates in our mainframe system either. We, we really, we have very few levers in the system because of how old it is and the fears that will crash the entire system. Um, so what they did is they increased the amount that's taxed uh, every year and that adjusts every single year based on the balance in the trust fund. And we also move between different tax schedules based on that balance. Since then, going into the pandemic, we had the healthiest uh, trust fund in the country. Um, we, I think, are on the way back towards being that again. And we were the only state that stayed in the top the top echelon of, of trust fund health that didn't pump its ARPA money into, or CARES Act money, I guess, into the trust fund to bolster it. So that gives you an idea that right now the system is pretty healthy with the way it's set up. Um, there, are, there are arguments that when we have the ability to fine tune the tax rates, we should probably consider doing that. Uh, I can't say we should or shouldn't, that's not for me, but there have been arguments that we should consider doing that because maybe our trust fund was even a little too healthy. So we're, we're overtaxing employers, but the problem is right now we can't get into the fine tuning of the tax rates. We, we have kind of these blunt tools like the maximum weekly benefit and the tax base that we can adjust each year and even those usually come close to crashing the entire system when we make those little adjustments in our 40, 50 year old. Uh, well, I'm trying to think. This code is from the beginning of the 1970s, so it's more than 50 years old. 
and it's a code that was dated when it was new. <laughs> so this code was new in the 50s, um, and it's it's a legacy mainframe code. We use a company outside of New York City that runs legacy mainframes for Wall Street companies <laughs> because no one, everyone who worked on the mainframe here is retired or dead. So there is no one in yeah. Vermont to service this anymore. That's right. So we are we are dealing with something where we have a couple of blunt tools that don't work. And I know I need to get back to the bill. But the, the bottom line is right now we have a very we have a healthy trust fund that's recovering effectively. And these little blips are unlikely to affect it. I'm sorry for getting so deep in the weeds. This is um, I saw three hands go up. Are they about the bill? <laughs> Sorry, Madam Chair. Representative Taylor. Um, just a quick clarification. The reimbursement, if one does the reimbursing option and never has, a, and it doesn't have a claim. You never pay anything. Why choose the taxable? Because when you have to reimburse a claim, that can be extremely sure. expensive. <laughs> it does more than just reimburse the claim, but also no, the, so the, the problem is, so imagine you're a nonprofit with four or five employees and a very tight budget and you've budgeted every penny and you're reimbursing the employer and you haven't set aside money for that. And then at the end of a quarter, you have 13 weeks paying out $500 a week. You get a bill for $6,500 and then the next quarter you get a bill for another $6,500. Mm -hmm. That can torpedo your budget for the year. It's one thing if you're the state, we, we have the general fund, we have taxing ability, we set aside, we basically anticipate these as part of our operating costs every year for employers like um, Forest Parks and Recreation and the General Assembly who have large numbers of seasonal employees. And that's, that's just part of your budget. But for a small nonprofit where you're on a shoestring budget, that can be crippling. So it seems like a good thing in the short term. And the, the thing to remember is it's not necessarily your layoff. If you employed them during the last five completed calendar quarters, you will be have some of those benefits attributed to you. So they could have left you for a higher paying job with a commercial employer. And then the commercial employer closes down their Vermont branch and you're on the hook for benefits. So. And during the pandemic, we heard from a lot of employers who say like a large private school um, then who basically shut down for six months, who had been a reimbursable employer, which meant like, you know, they sort of had the cash flow for a few people coming and going each year. And then all of a sudden it was 50 folks they were laying off and they just were not prepared for that. Yeah. And that, that was the. Uh... There was help from the federal government, but for a lot of the reimbursable employers, it was uh, not an, not enough, and it came a little too late to be helpful. So, okay. Um, Representative Anthony oh, Maslin. Oh, cool. Okay. Thanks. Representative Maslin, did you have? Uh, I mean, it just gives me great uh, comfort to know that there are Wall Street firms that are using the same old stuff, <laughs> and you didn't comment on that, but it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to steer clear of that one. We're not alone. <laughs> no, but hopefully in the next few years, we'll actually have a modern computer system wow. to run this. Um, so turning to the... Uh, and you can screen share now, I think. Yes. Um, uh, turning to the, the more complicated math, um, the... This is the effective, the, the sunset from the compromise that we had following the pandemic when we imposed the temporary increase in the maximum weekly benefit. And that's followed, except for uh, July 1, 2025, but likely it'll be pushed out because the computer system modernization for unemployment insurance isn't anticipated to be done by them because of delays in procurement. Um, so what we're looking at is through June 30th, 2025, or 
until $8 million in additional benefits are paid out under the, the $60 increase in the maximum weekly benefit, that will stay in place. When it hits $8 million paid out, that additional $60 drops out of the statute. The catch is, under the law, you are not allowed, the maximum weekly benefit cannot go down. We added that a few years ago on the off chance that in another recession, you would see uh, it's tied to the state average weekly wage and you would see that drop. And then you would see beneficiaries, people who are getting claims lose benefits from June to July. Uh, it updates on July of every year. So we have it, it stays at wherever it is last until it can rise again. So the catch here is that with the extra $60, we see this increase by 20 or $30 a year. Uh, the catch is that when it reverts to the regular formula, we're likely to have one to two years where the formula doesn't catch up. And so we stay frozen at this artificially high maximum weekly benefit. I'm just gonna pretend that phone's not ringing. <laughs> so we stay at this artificially high maximum weekly benefit but if you look at the way I drafted it originally, I said the difference between $8 million, which was the sunset for the first benefit amount, and the amount of additional benefits paid out pursuant to that amount, if any, what I didn't anticipate was that fact that we were gonna stay at a higher maximum weekly benefit amount for a year or two after uh, it reverts back to the old formula. And the agreement, between the House and the Senate and the conference was that we were gonna pay out $100 million in additional benefits, and that was it. So what this in effect does is the old language would have had us paying out about 103, 106, depends on how much demand there was then, but we would have been paying out more than what the compromise was. So the new language is basically saying we add the additional amount for when the computer system gets modernized, plus the additional amount paid out as a result of this temporary increase in the maximum weekly benefit. And when that hits $100, $100 million, it sunsets. And it just, it's fixing that gap where I wasn't counting the sort of lag in the benefits there. Um, and I missed this when we were negotiating this it, uh, it was Cameron Wood over at the Department of Labor who was doing the math on this, trying to project when, the, when all of this was going to happen. And he called me up in June and he said, I think, I think we've got an issue with the math. And, and um, sure enough, when we charted it out, he was exactly right. Um, so this fixes that issue. It makes it so it'll sunset at $100 million like we agreed and like the legislature intended. Um, and so that that's all it does but it for your revenues of the state perspective this will have an effect on the trust fund balance which affects that tax rate so it'll allow the trust fund balance to return to a higher uh to a higher balance sooner which will drop the tax rate sooner potentially and has joyce been involved in this thus far uh, not in this language. When we were doing the projections for this, um, JFO was closely involved, and we have all sorts of charts from back then. Um, and all of this is contingent on whether, when and whether there's another recession. It may affect tax rates. It may not just because of the way that there's a lag in when the tax rate is set and when the benefits are set. So you, you could see that you would have hit that amount anyway because the balance in the fund is so large that sometimes a million or $2 million won't have an effect. And in some cases it will, it just depends on what month you hit that, that balance in. Thanks. But, cool. Anything else in the bill? No, everything else doesn't uh, really affect the revenues of the state. Will you um, tell us about I anything else? Tell you what is in there. Or, or vote on it. Yeah, do you want me to, can I take it off the screen? and just scroll through quickly. Um, so the other pieces in the bill, um, besides that, there uh, is a report on possibly allowing individuals to get uh, unemployment 
uh, if they've had to leave work for an urgent circumstance like the illness of a family member uh, or um, domestic or sexual violence. Uh, and so they, they can't get benefits till they're able and available to work again. But currently, uh, an illness of a family member or domestic and sexual violence wouldn't qualify you for unemployment. There is a separate program to transition uh, individuals who have suffered from domestic or sexual violence, uh, provide them with similar benefits. Uh, it's not well known. Uh, and there's another <laughs> section in here that helps publicize that. Um, but uh, so this is a study of what the impact of allowing some of these additional reasons would have on the trust fund so that we can have a better sense before we make a decision. And that's allowed under federal law? It is. Um, we have a little bit of leeway. Uh, Massachusetts has some language on this and a couple other states. Um, it, it's hard to kind of figure out from those other states, though, just by looking at their overall numbers, what impact, if any, this really has. And so you're going to study it. For so we're going to study it and try to figure that out. Um, Representative Ken Hill. Yep. And are they going to also look at how that would interplay with family leave? Should that that's uh, so the the answer is if family leave passes, um, your so this is really addressing the instance of if an individual for some reason doesn't have job protection, um, so they lose their job, they have to quit their job in for this leave reason, and then when they're able and available to look again. Uh, at that point. So for example, uh, an example of this could be someone would be eligible for family leave, but because of the nature of the illness they have, they need six or nine months before they're able and available to work. And so they lose their job in the interim because their employer can't keep them on and the law only extends for three months. Then when they're able and available again, they could claim benefits. Um, but for individuals who have job protection and are able to return at, at uh, the end of their leave, this wouldn't affect them at all. Um, so if family leave passed, presumably we'd be dealing with a pretty small number of folks, but I'm sure they'll get a better sense of what that population would look like um, when the study happens and they'll be able to see at that point if family leave goes through, start trying to project that in. Massachusetts has both, so they may be a good case study. Um, so they've got, um, we, we could see if their experience changed since their family leave law came on online. Um, and what else is in the bill? Uh, like I said, there's um, additional language around improving utilization of the existing program for domestic and sexual violence survivors. Uh, there's also language requiring the department to um, provide additional notice to the public of that program. Um, and let's just see. Um, and then Emma described the work, the outreach to reimbursable employers. And the last piece in there is some definitional changes to um, define son, daughter, and child uh, to include um, a variety of family situations uh, that might occur, and then to define spouse to include domestic partners and civil union partners. Um, those terms appear relatively infrequently, but uh, it's part of an effort to make it more inclusive to recognize the variety of families we have in Vermont. So. Uh, the, uh, the use of domestic partners just brought back. The yeah, so their domestic partner is not uh, defined in the unemployment law, but that would be covered through departmental um, rulemaking. So, yeah. Representative, just uh, Damien. Um, of course, the trust fund will fluctuate. Yeah. These changes. Um, is it not true, though, that uh, roping in the nonprofits 
would also potentially benefit income tax collections in the, the circumstance where people were not participating, lost their jobs from a nonprofit, their income might otherwise fall to something less. Uh, presumably, I mean, unemployment insur insurance benefits are taxable. They are. And so, so presumably you might see a slight uptick in okay. state income tax revenues. I imagine it would be relatively minimal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You probably had testimony from nonprofits. They did, uh, and that that's reflected in the involvement of United Way of Northwest Vermont and Common Good Vermont um, in developing outreach materials for nonprofits. And a lot of the language around outreach was developed um, uh, by the committee after testimony from uh, those two groups and some other nonprofits. In this summer, Chair Marcotte and I went to the Common Good annual meeting to talk about this issue in particular, and I think they included it in their annual survey as well. And there was some, some testimony, too, during the unemployment insurance summer study a few years back on this issue because that it, that was during the pandemic, so it was fresh in everyone's mind at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Damien. Thanks, Emma. You're welcome. Sorry for the the oh. sound trip. It was it was fun. It's indeed. Um, we are done for the day for real and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah, I'm done.